So welcome to our hybrid learning opening. We have been so excited to get to this point, but uh, it has been a fast and furious ride for us. So, Mr. Young, yes. before I get going, are you going to set up the Spanish or no? Right here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was trying to get to the, the happy face Mr. Rubio. So uh, this, believe it or not, is Mr. Rubio back there, and he always has his smile on his face. But uh, Mr. Rubio, go ahead and uh, reach out to our Spanish speakers and let them know what they need to do. Sorry for jumping the gun. Um, bienvenidos a todos. Vamos a estar haciendo esta junta um, a la misma vez, a la par, en español. La señora Yerington nos va a estar ayudando. Y ese es un nuevo sistema que estamos aquí tratando de, de, de investigar. Así es que les vamos a pedir en un momentito uh, ustedes van a ver una opción abajo de su, donde pueden ver mi fotografía. Ahí abajo van a ver una opción donde pueden ustedes escuchar la presentación en inglés o en español. Si ustedes escogen la opción de español, van a estar mirando la presentación que tenemos aquí. Sin embargo, van a estar escuchando a la señora Yerington. En vez de salirnos y hacer diferentes juntas y hacer diferentes cosas, todos vamos a estar aquí en este mismo lugar Nada más tienen que uh, uh, escoger uh, la opción que dice español y en ese momento van a escuchar a la señora Jennington. So we are excited to have uh, students back after so long. So there is a tremendous amount to go over here. Our teachers are really excited to see students back on campus. Uh, you know, hopefully you had the opportunity to see the schedule and I'll try to slow my pace down for our translation. But I have sent this out to you a couple of different times through email and messaging, and hopefully your students have received this as well. But this is our hybrid bell schedule, which looks extremely like the distance learning schedule. So Monday actually hasn't changed at all. All six periods on Monday are the same time, and the same place. So the same time and the same place. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the start time is the same every day. The end time has only changed by five minutes. Uh, so in that, when I say end time, the lunch time. And then the end time at two o'clock has not changed at, at all. The difference is, and I'll try, the color coding really helps here. If you are in the A group for hybrid, you are in person on Tuesday and Wednesday. On Tuesday, you'll go to your zero period if you have one, then one, two, and three. On Wednesday, you'll do the other half of your schedule, four, five, and six. If you are a B group person, you will have in-person learning on campus Thursday and Friday with the same periods as the A group did on theirs. Notice though, the B group and the DL, the distance learning group, they are online together on both of these days. On the Thursday, Friday, the A group switches and becomes the online group. So your students will be with their teachers the same amount of time they were on distance learning. The only difference is two days a week they will be on campus and with, with their teacher face to face. So hopefully that's not too confusing. When we get to 1155 and we're going to be talking about this, students will, you know, we have a lunch period here, but lunch is not on campus. We'll talk specifically about that and we transition to our academic support time after lunch, which will be online for all students. So Tuesday through Friday, all of our students are online for the afternoon to get this specialized academic support. And if you have specific questions, you know, feel free to drop it in the chat now or save it till our question and answer time. And this is the, the key part that probably a lot of people are wondering about. We, we have what we call shared responsibility. We are going to partner with you for the health and safety of your students, for your extended family, and for our staff as well here. So we do ask 
that you run a, a symptom self-check with your students. Our staff does this every day. They're required to before they come to work. And we ask that you do this with your students as well. So that is, we do ask that you take their temperature, check to see if they have a fever. If it is 100.4 or greater, they stay home, okay? And then if you look at the other symptoms, you know, obviously if they have a sore throat, a headache, muscle ache, congestion, runny nose, fever, we want you to keep them home. Section two, these are the ones that are what we would call the higher risk symptoms that we are looking for or being aware of. And that is a new cough, difficulty breathing, or the loss of taste or smell. And that is where it's recommended that you see your healthcare provider and possibly test for COVID-19. So that is your system, your symptom self-check. Now, when students arrive on campus, having had their symptom self-check, here's what they're going to do. We do have an overhead here shot of our campus. But before we kind of talk about the arrows and things uh, with that, our drop-off is very similar to what it used to be before. In fact, from the car standpoint, it won't change at all. And if you are a seventh grade parent, we're gonna talk specifically about what that looks like in just a moment. But you will drop off in the parking lot as you always do. Parents or anybody dropping off, they're not permitted to come on campus. So everything is gonna be a drop off at the curb, in the driveway, you know, just around the block, wherever your normal drop off point is. Students, when they arrive on campus, they must wear a mask. From the moment they leave your car to the moment they get back in your car at the end of the day, they will have a mask on and we'll have specifics about that in a moment. Our first bell will ring at 825 in the morning. Students, if they arrive at that time or even a minute or two later, they will go directly to class. If they arrive before 825, we are going to, I'm, yeah, if they arrive before 825, we are going to have them direct, follow these directional arrows depending on their grade level. So if you can see this map, the eighth graders will proceed to what we call our upper field area and they will wait there for the beginning of their first class. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Seventh graders are going to make their way onto campus. They will come through our main gate right here. And actually you can see it behind Mr. Rubio uh, in his image. He has our main gate behind him. He's, he's letting you see, there's our main gate behind Mr. Rubio. And they will come through there and proceed to our lunch area and our basketball court area. And we're gonna ask them not only to wear their mask, but continue with social distancing while they are outside and throughout their time on campus here. But they will wait until that first bell rings in these places. On Tuesday morning, their teachers will be outside holding up a sign with their name on it and they will also be marked on the fence where the classes are going to line up. We're doing this because some of your students have never been on our campus before. So if we gave you a room number, it would be very difficult for them to find that class on the first day, especially keeping social distancing requirements in place. So this is how we're going to start our first day. We're actually going to do this for our entire first week for the beginning of our day. So just the first hour of each day, this is where students will meet their teachers for the first week until we understand where all of our classes are. So here's what our parking lot looks like. There are several images of our parking lot. And you'll see that our parking lot has three different traffic lanes. So for the, the two traffic lanes that are closest to the cars and the parking stalls, those are what we call the drop off area or the pickup area. The third lane, uh, those first two lanes, you may stop your car, 
you may allow your student to exit out of the car to come onto campus. But make sure your students exit the car slowly. They look before they walk across the, uh, the lanes of uh, traffic and that they're very careful. This third lane or the lane closest to the campus, that is what we call our through traffic lane or our moving lane. We don't stop in that lane ever. It's always for traffic to continue moving so they can exit out the parking lot on this side of the parking lot toward the traffic light. This crosswalk right here is very close to where our flagpole is. And this is the line where cars may come to the parking lot at the end of the day or even in the morning. And they can pull all the way up to this crosswalk to drop off their students. So they could drop off their students in the first two lanes pulling up here. If you happen to arrive early for pickup, you can pull as far up to the crosswalk as the traffic allows and you can turn your engine off and wait for your student there. All right. Now, student movement on campus. Once students get on campus, we have changed our traffic pattern on campus for students. So we have one-way hallways, one-way corridors, one-way traffic, and it all runs counterclockwise. So I'm going to show you a different picture in just a moment, but you'll see that some of our doors are marked very clearly enter only. Some are marked very clearly exit only. Previously, those doors had traffic going both ways. They are all now one way. And you'll see that once you move into the main building and even our exterior corridors are marked with arrows on the wall and on the ground, pointing students to the direction that they will be traveling in that hallway. You'll also notice that uh, some of our offices are closed or restricted. Our counseling office won't be available for drop-ins, but students will be able to meet with counselors by appointment. And there will be a QR code that they can scan outside the office and they can set up an appointment with a counselor. Uh, during, you know, when, whenever it's most convenient for the student and the counselor. And then you'll see our bathrooms. Our bathrooms are marked uh, for health and safety. We're not permitting more than two students in a bathroom at a time. So if a student should open the door and find more than one student in there, they will wait outside until another student exits the bathroom uh, for them. You also see that we do have hand washing sta stations around our campus. And that is for you know students to frequently wash. We have one here, it's a single with soap and paper towels. And this one has two sinks or two uh, places to wash as well as water bottle fillers. So students can get water there as well. All of our drinking fountains will be closed down. They will have no water access. So this will be the place to fill up. So it's really important that students bring a water bottle that they can refill on campus to make sure that they stay hydrated. This is what our traffic pattern looks like inside and outside from the air. So if you look at our campus, all of the traffic, it, well, well, we'll come to the color code here. It's clockwise traffic. Our forum is indicated by the green arrows the main building is indicated by the pink arrows and the outside of the campus is the yellow and the 300 building is this aqua arrow. So students will follow these and, and I won't go into too much detail with you as parents um, other than the fact that if a parent or a visitor has an appointment on campus, they will enter through our um, main entrance right here where the, where the gate, main gate is, where you saw Mr. Rubio sitting in front of, and they will proceed directly ahead to our attendance windows here. And they will be able to uh, uh, make, let the office know that they're there and we can get the appointment uh, going in a different location. 
I think that as far as parents, I think that's probably all you really need to know about student movement on campus. Uh, there will be one way gates, you know, gates that uh, are, are three gates that we have on campus. They students will only be permitted to go in one direction at different parts during the day. Um, so we'll make sure that the, the students actually uh, did get an overview of this over the last two days in their classrooms through GMS. And those uh, videos are also posted on our website. So if you would like to go in and look on our website, you can actually see the videos that uh, depict the student movement and what it looks like from the interior. Oop, sorry, went to the wrong one here. So I am way off. My, I've, I've made my screen far too big uh, for you to see, and I can't see the smaller uh, slides. So I'm going to turn this one over to uh, Ms. Bramley. Yeah. Mr. Young, really quick before we, we do that. Liliana, puedes hablar un poco más fuerte porque algunos uh, tienen problemas escuchándote. Por favor. Gracias. Sorry. Thank you. Are you good, Mr. Rubio? Okay. I'm a really fast talker, so I'm going to have to slow down so I don't kill Miss Yerington for translation purposes. Um, all right. So masks at school. Um, so one of the safety protocols that we've put in place is that masks need to be worn at all times by students and um, staff when they are on campus. So from the moment your kiddo arrives to campus, until they leave, they have to keep that mask on with a few exceptions. So one of those exceptions is if they are eating. So at break, um, they can bring their own snack to, to break. The lunch line won't be open to purchase any food. But if they bring a snack, they can take their mask off to eat. Um, they also will be able to remove their mask. No, I'm already talking too fast. I can tell. Uh, they can remove their mask also in uh, PE. So uh, PE, when it is outdoors for physical activity, they'll be able to remove their mask as well. If PE um, is doing something indoors, like the gym or in one of their classrooms or a fitness room, they will have to put the ma wear the mask. But if they're outdoors um, and doing physical fitness, they can take the mask off. Um, not to be confused with our break time or our passing periods or before school or after school. So just because they are outdoors does not mean that they can remove the mask. It's only for PE for that physical activity. Um, or if they're eating during break, they can take a break from the mask, eat, and then they'll have to put it back on. The other exception would be if your students bring water bottles as well with them. Uh, our drinking fountains are either have been removed or are, have been shut off for sanitary reasons for health and safety. So uh, if, your, your, if your student would like water during the day, they need to bring a water bottle with them. And if they need to have a drink of water during class or something like that, we have informed all of our teachers that whatever the teacher's policy is for that, so if the teacher is comfortable having them take the mask off briefly, take a drink of water, or um, step outside the room and take a drink of water, they can do that. So to eat or to take a drink of water, they can remove the mask or for PE um, purposes for physical activity. Um, the other thing is the face covering does have to be something that covers their nose and their mouth. So the face shields do not qualify as, as a mask. And it does need to be worn with the nose and mouth covered. So I know a lot of times, well, I know mine slips down a lot or you know kids wear it kind of down here so if you can just make sure that they know and we'll be reminding them but um nose mouth face covering need to be worn at all times except uh during pe physical activities or to take a drink of water or eat and they need to put it back on so arrival to class um so uh when your student comes to class at the beginning of the day each day we have thermometers in all of the classrooms so first period and fourth period their temperatures will be taken and just and that's just one additional layer of of health screening and if the temperature on the thermometer reads at a 99 they'll just be sent to the office for additional screening to make sure that they meet kind of the health and safety standards. Um, we will, you know, get our, um, our, our gun thermometer out um, so that we can take their temperature and see what it is. Uh, the temperature that would possibly send your student home would be 100.4. So in the classroom, the teachers are going to be screening for 99. 
that means that they'll just have to come to the office for some additional screenings. Um, and if the temperature was at 100.4, then we'd ask them to, uh, then we'd ask you to come and pick them up. Um, so it's one additional health screening. Uh, in addition to that, so the students will walk into the room, they'll take their temperature, they will also pick up a, a wipe, a sanitary wipe, a kind of Clorox bleach wipe, so that they can wipe down their work area and make sure it's nice and clean for them. Um, they'll And hold on to that wipe or take a second one so that they can do it at the end of class um, as well. And also hand sanitizer. So all of the classrooms are equipped with hand sanitizer. Uh, in addition, our hallways also have sanitizing stations um, with hand sanitizer and the, the hand washing stations as well. And so students can use that if, if they need it. Um, desk dividers, I noticed a question in the chat kind of about that. So desk dividers are no longer required. However, if your student would like to use one, they are in all of the classrooms and so they can use that. So um, it sounded like there was uh, maybe some, some different kind of uh, schools of thought on that, that the students would have to carry it home with them or they might have to carry it on their bike or something like that. All of the classrooms have the desk dividers there and so students will be able to use it in the classroom. Um, there is enough to either uh, be sanitized in between classrooms or in between classes or to use a second set for the following class. So if your student would like to use a de desk divider that is provided in the classrooms for them um, or if teachers would like students to use desk dividers as well um, then they'll have those on on the desks as well. So those are there as well. And then all of their personal items that your student brings to campus with them in their backpack, right? So their devices, their headphones, those kind of things will just stay with them at their, at their workspace. And then I think Mr. Young, that's a little video about what the thermometer, what that process kind of looks like when they take their temperature. Perfect. So you can see when uh, it flashes at uh, 100 degrees, right, or at 99. And our teachers will be screening for that 99. So if, if a 99 shows up, does not mean that um, your student will be sent home or anything. They'll just be sent to the office for additional health screening to make sure that everybody's safe quickly, very quickly, and then we'll get them back to class if they don't hit that 100.4 or have other symptoms. So during class, um, as you can see that picture shows, and I think there's been kind of a lot of pictures, Saddleback has been really good about the photos of what classrooms look like. Um, but that picture shows this is what the majority of all of our classrooms look like. So all of the desks have been spaced out six feet um, apart. Uh, the desk dividers, you know, may be set up if the teachers or the students want to use them, but there is social distancing in place in our classrooms. And so all of the students' workspaces will be six feet apart from the other students and six feet from the teacher. Uh, students will, like I said, bring their supplies every day. It's really important that students bring their device with them. So either their school issued Chromebook or if you're bringing your own device that Mr. Young will talk about in just a second. Bring that as well as headphones. So uh, teachers are going to be using a variety of different instructional modalities. Sometimes that might be, you know, uh, a student, uh, students in the class on Zoom with students outside of the class so they can group them up. It could be a recorded video of the, of the teacher lecturing that students can access kind of independently. But uh, all of those modalities will, will certainly mean that it will be, uh, your students need headphones so that they can be listening to whatever instruction they're kind of interacting with. Um, so make sure they're bringing their device and, and their headphones because it's going to be essential for what the teacher has planned um, that day. And it's going to look a little different from day to day and from class to class. Uh, students will not be sharing personal items or classroom supplies with, with, other, with other students. Um, so unless a supply can be sanitized in between the use of another student or we have, you know, two sets of it, um, classroom supplies will not be shared. So no shared kind of bucket of markers or um, scissors or things like that. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, and then in addition, like I was saying, all classes have all the, the PPE that you see in that other video. So um, masks if students need it, uh, sanitation wipes, gloves, those are all in every single classroom. Uh, one additional thing is, I think there was a question in the chat about um, if a student could show 
a teacher their work if they're having computer issues. And I think this is referring to, you know, can teachers or an instructional assistant or staff approach a student and, and help and get within that six feet um, range? So absolutely, um, they can. Whenever possible, we want to make sure that we keep the six feet distance between people. But of course, teachers will be helping your students um, in the classroom. Instructional assistants and staff will be helping the students within the classroom. We've all and all of course, if of um, sanitizing a, a keyboard before they touch it or after things like that um, and maintaining the social distance as much as possible. And so moving in to help the student and then, and then moving out. I'll turn Next. it back over to you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Next up, and, and you know, we started off the presentation with this great enthusiasm for seeing students and and that, that is still there, but sometimes it, all of these protocols get in the way to think all of these things that we have to do. And, and parents, I want to share with you, the goalposts have moved so many times, so often, so frequently. It's been really hard to keep up with. What is the latest protocol in place for, you know, whether it's from the mask to the cleaning of the, you know, supplies to whatever. We, we are in constant contact with the Orange County Healthcare Agency and through the depart, uh, you know, through the CDC. And we are getting information on a constant basis and we are adjusting to it. So I appreciate your patience with this. Uh, and you know the the device is one of those issues that changed just this week in terms of the device protocols. Uh, we were anticipating having some Chromebooks available for your students to use in their classrooms this week. However, that was not uh, uh, available. We are not allowed to do that. That's why the call went out uh, earlier this week to have parents who haven't yet checked out a Chromebook to check one out. Students are expected to have a Chromebook or a computer, a laptop, a computing device every day here at school. It is essential for their learning because we aren't using textbooks because we can't share them. And students will be accessing their work through the online platform. We won't be handing out many papers. I won't say we won't ever hand out papers, but we have been asked to cut that way, way back. So a device is important. So please bring the Chromebook you checked out, if you checked one out, to school every day, fully charged. Bring the charger just in case there's an emergency and you need to charge it up. Um, so that's really important. If you did not check out, a, you, you may bring your own device. So if you prefer to use your own personal Chromebook or your own laptop, you may bring that in if you would choose to. You don't have to, but you need to have a device. So we do have Chromebooks available for checkout. They do need to be taken home at the end of each day and brought back. If you don't do that, what will happen is your student will have to line up. Hopefully we can do this before school starts and get them a Chromebook checkout for the day. They will have to check it out in the morning before school. They will have to stay after school to return it to the, uh, to the library. So to avoid having to do that on a daily basis, we would rather have you take one home and bring it back each day because those have to be the ones that are checked out just for the day have to be sanitized every day and reissued out the very next day which takes away learning time from your students so we would like you to make sure you bring in a device um, each and every school day so what is school going to look like when your students come back well I want to start by saying the hybrid model is a transition model. This is not meant to be the end all be all of education. 
this is not supposed to be the, the highest point that we are going to reach. It is a transition which enables your students to come back onto campus and get live instruction from their teacher face to face. So what our teachers will be doing, if you think back to that first slide, the schedule, the online students are going to be in class through Zoom or through a video conferencing software, just as the face-to-face -face students will be present. So that instruction will be taking place at the same time. That's why it's called concurrent instruction. This is extremely difficult. Two weeks ago, our teachers learned of this and they have been furiously working to devise methods and models and instructional practices that will reach both groups of students simultaneously. Now that doesn't mean they will all simultaneously be on uh, together. Let's just say their class starts at 8.30 in the morning the face-to-face -face group is working on something with the teacher face-to-face. -face. The online group may be doing something asynchronous or do they may be working on something that's been pre-recorded. And those groups will kind of switch what they do during the period. So the live instruction where the teacher is actually giving instruction to the teacher may not necessarily happen simultaneously, but within that hour, it will. Now you think, okay, that sounds really difficult and really hard. And one of the pictures I put in here is a picture of Mr. Pine, one of our teachers, and he was actually teaching his colleagues how to do this in their classrooms. So you might be thinking, this is really difficult. Why are we doing it this way? Well, students, have been affected by dis distance learning. Students have been affected through this pandemic. I heard a statistic just this morning that more than one third of, of young people under 18, more than one third have thought about suicide in the last 30 days. That's the statistical average. Those students and the isolation that they're feeling, the disconnect that they're feeling from peers, from other people, the sacrifice from this instructional model that may not be the ideal is worth it to us to be able to bring these students back on campus, to connect them and engage them with role models, with peers, with our counselors who can, who can help them out. That is worth it to us. So we do ask that you bear with us as we move into this new type of learning and teaching model um, so that we can get to all aspects of our students to help them in every way possible. So next up, PE, one of the favorite areas to talk about in a social distance pandemic area. Mr. Rubio, why don't you tell us about PE? Absolutely. So, um, locker room, you guys remember that being in middle school and uh, going to the locker room for the first time. Well, the locker room is going to look different, not necessarily uh, the way we remember it. Um, no, students will not be dressing out for PE. There was a question that just popped up a, a few minutes ago. Uh, students will not be dressing out for PE. Uh, therefore, students, uh, so it will not be open. Uh, so, no, kids will not be going in and out of the locker room. And whatnot. So what we, we've suggested uh, for uh, teachers and what we're suggesting for students to do, and now we're telling you parents, is to perhaps in the day that they do have PE to dress a little more comfortable uh, in clothing. They're not going to be necessarily running the miles and playing basketball and doing what they got to do. However, they may be um, involved in stretches or yoga or whatever it is that our uh, PE teachers are working on an alternative assignment to uh, address the PE needs of our students. So I don't know, maybe the, the students wear shorts that day, a little more relaxed sweater or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, the, the lockers will be unavailable. And since we don't have lockers around here for books, uh, we don't have to talk about that. 
so it is important that students bring their backpacks, uh, you know, with their belongings. Uh, there were a couple of questions if students need to be bringing their um, textbooks and their Chromebooks and, uh, and, and whatever the case may be. Um, we suggest that you, your student, checks with the teacher to see what the classroom needs are going to be. Uh, many of our textbooks are available online, so it is expected that uh, the teachers will be using that uh, feature uh, for students to be using, uh, you know, the, the textbook online, as well as any other features. Uh, we do suggest that you uh, have your student, you know, bring a snack uh, in their backpack uh, for, for throughout the day. Um, for when we have a break, I mean, bring a water bottle. Um, and I don't know if uh, Mr. Yeah, actually, it's probably the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, so yeah, double check uh, on your backpack uh, to make sure that you have the supplies, but check with your teacher during that day, okay? Uh, and that way the students keep it and keep their stuff in their belongings. Food services. Uh, we will have grab and go lunches. Uh, they will be provided to all students free of charge uh, when they are on campus. On Mondays, uh, when students are not on com campus, uh, there will be food available for once again for grab and go for pickup between nine and 10 um, at the front parking lot. You will see the ladies set up, okay? And uh, students will pick up those meals and they will give them enough meals for those three days that the, they do not come to campus. Once again, if, um, if, if your students wanna get lunch, uh, breakfast, uh, they will receive them on those days. Uh, I'll actually touch base now on the backpacks. Bring a snack. Uh, just because the food is uh, grab and go now at the end of the day, during the 10 minute break that students will be offered, uh, there will not be any sales so, or anything. Um, I knew we had vending machines and those were primarily water, uh, but everything has been shut down. So we suggest that your student brings a water bottle. We do have refillable stations uh, where the kids can go in there and uh, fill up their water bottle. Um, so thank you, I think uh, somebody's typing as we speak. Uh, so yeah, there will be no, uh, no food being sold, nothing, no interaction when it comes to that, okay? Um, so once again, back to the food, uh, meals will be provided, anybody under uh, 18 years of age, and uh, between those hours on Monday, between nine and 10 and 11 and 12.30, uh, at any locations, we are one of those locations, as you see our name on there, Serrano Intermediate, so your students on Mondays can come and pick up that, okay? Um, and once again, during the school day on Tuesdays and or whenever it is that they're here, on their way out, uh, walking home or on their way to the car, they can swing by the two locations that we'll have. And I'll point it out uh, in, in one of the slides that's popping up. Uh, coming up, uh, we'll show you where those areas are at. So that's about it. School dismissal, unlike uh, the entry where we have specific areas that Mr. Young was pointing out where the seventh graders go towards the back and the eighth graders go towards uh, the other side over here. Um, thank you, Mr. Young. Um, you see the red <laughs> arrows. The red arrows are going to be the locations where we allow students to exit the campus. To exit. So... Uh, now, the yellow arrows. The yellow arrows are for those students who want to get the lunch that we were talking about. You see those uh, little yellow uh, squares? Those are going to be the food cart uh, areas where they will be going in. Uh, students have to follow that clockwork rotation that we were talking about. They will, be, uh, they will set themselves in a line. Hopefully the line won't be too long. Uh, the, the students grab their lunch and they proceed towards the exit. They keep going. So that's school dismissal. Uh, the bell rings uh, at 11.55. Um, thank you. Um, so the school uh, will be dismissed at 11.55 uh, for students to grab their lunch and go. Uh, once again, we will not, uh, there will be no one left on campus to eat lunch or whatever the case may be. It is expected that students uh, leave the premises, be picked up. By 1210, there will be no supervision outside of uh, the main building or the area. So we please ask you to promptly uh, make arrangements or have your student walk or pick up your student uh, when the bell does ring. Uh, the students will have their lunch 
And then after, I believe, 40 minutes of lunch, they can get ready to uh, go to their uh, academic support to their classes and finish off what they were doing. Um, so yeah, this missile looks very much like a rival. Students come to the parking lot. No one's allowed on campus. So parents, please uh, stay in there. Your, your student will be picked up and then um, they get to go with you. Um, and lastly, on my slides, I believe, um, cleaning during the day. Uh, so we will be um, cleaning campus throughout the day. Uh, our custodial staff will be, you know, work, working uh, the high traffic areas and cleaning uh, as much as uh, they're going to be set up in a rotation. Okay? Uh, the entrances, the doorways, the bathrooms and everything. Students will also wipe down their workspace as Mr. Young stated earlier. They will be given a wipe so they can come in and get it going just like you would do when you go to the gym or you're on an airplane or wherever it is that you may go. You normally clean around yourself before you use the facilities. We're kind of asking the students to do the same area. So once again, the high touch areas, uh, it will be cleaned by staff, my custodial staff and everyone else throughout the day. All restrooms will be sanitized by the custodial team frequently. Classrooms will be cleaned and disinfected every night uh, by an electrostatic sprayer. So the custodial staff will come in, do the cleaning, and then they're gonna go around with this little Ghostbuster looking uh, backpack and electrostatic hand looking device. And they're gonna be spraying everything uh, to ensure that uh, the classroom is ready for the students for the next day. And in addition to that, uh, our HVAC system, the main system here has been revamped. They have some uh, HEPA filters installed uh, and everything should be good in order to ensure that our air is clean. In addition to that, this is a recent addition. You will see at the bottom right hand side picture, every classroom is going to have a portable air purifier that's going to be running throughout the day in that classroom to ensure that we have that added uh, feature and bonus of cleaning the air around. Next, front office reminders. Uh, just because of the situation that we're in, and it is 2020, we got to ensure that everyone is safe around here. So uh, the campus essentially is uh, closed to visitors unless you make an appointment. So we ask you that if you need to come on campus, call in advance and uh, make an appointment that you're here. If you need to you know, see the counselor, if you need to see one of us, or you have any questions, please call in, advance, call in advance and let them know that you will be here. The phone number is right there. Um, also, you can find the phone number in our school website, okay? Um, Mr. Young, did I miss anything? Well, you have made it to the end of our presentation, but uh, there are some days where you just feel like you've been hit in the face with a pie. And, uh, you know, we've been facing it for, for weeks and weeks here, but we are super excited to step in front of your students maybe and do this activity another time. Um, we want you as parents to know that you know, we are definitely in this together. Um, we, we have been struggling through not having school for so long and then the distance learning component of it. Um, and we value your support. We value your patience with us as we've uh, moved through this and patience with the whole system as it moves forward. Um, and we really want to partner with you to ensure that we can keep Serrano open uh, because we do have some pretty strict healthcare requirements. Uh, not on the slide, I will let you know that uh, if a student or a staff member does test positive for COVID-19, the entire class that that student or staff member is will be quarantined for 14 days. So that is one of those health and safety protocols that we are under. There are lots of other details that are just too minute to go in, but I do wanna let you know that those stakes make it seem really high to affect the learning of all of those kids in the class should somebody 
have the virus and come to school. So that's why we really want you to partner with us, do those symptom checks at home before they come on. Make sure that you're encouraging them to social distance while they're here. I know young people feel invincible and I know there are groups out there that think that this is insignificant for young people that they get it and they get over it. Even if that's the case, even if we all got it and we all got healthy, it would interrupt the learning of all of these students that Due to health protocols, we have to quarantine when we are exposed. So please partner with us. Let's keep it safe and healthy. Keep our kids on campus. And hopefully as the weeks tick by and the months tick by, we can get more and more back on campus, stay longer and longer. That is definitely our hope. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this recording will be posted on our website uh, later on this afternoon or evening, so you can come back uh, to it if you need to. We will go into question and answer time now. I will ask uh, that we'll, we'll start with those uh, things that have been posted in the chat that have uh, been unanswered in the chat. And then we, we will hang out for at least 30 minutes with you, at least. So if you have questions that you haven't put in the chat, please put them in. And then there may be an opportunity. Let's see, I think we have 136 people in the chat. Uh, probably still too many to do uh, voice questions uh, just to keep it somewhat streamlined. So put them in the chat. If the group gets smaller, we'll let you use uh, that uh, unmute feature. But thank you for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share now and we can all kind of see each other, which is kind of fun. So Mr. Rubio or Ms. Branley, yes. if you want to uh, fish through the, those chats and- Okay, we'll I've been doing my best and I think I've captured all your questions because some of them were group I'm grouping together, all right? So, but if I don't get you, then just pop it back in, in the chat, all right? So um, let's see. First question I think is, um, that I'm gonna lump a couple questions together is we had several questions about dropping off and picking up and kind of how many kids are going to be on campus total? How many kids are we going to have in a class? And then, so is that going to make our drop off pickup situation look better? Oh, yes, yes. And yes, we are, we are assuming that our campus is going to look dramatically different. I mean, as uh, Ms. Branley, Mr. Ruby and I were trying to kind of figure out, okay, student movement on campus, break time, how many kids? Uh, what we are looking at is roughly 350 students on campus each of the two days. Um, it may be a uh, fluctuate, you know, by 10 or 15 uh, on one way or the other, but roughly 350 students on campus. We dividing into the A and the B group has obviously enabled us to, uh, you know, cut that size down in the classroom as well, separate out also the distance learning only groups. So our class sizes, I mean, we have some classes as small as six on any given day. We have some that push upwards of 18. We will not put more students in a room that we cannot separate by six feet. So some of our classrooms are a little bit larger, so we're able to have more students in there and keep them socially distanced. Others are a little bit smaller, so we're making sure that we do not put more students in than can be socially distanced. We are trying to shoot for a maximum of 15 in any given class, but some electives are a little bit higher. PE classes might be a little bit higher, but PE is outdoors. So that is that is the area that we're shooting for right now. Um, okay, and then in terms of getting ready for um, online learn or for hybrid learning on Tuesday, checking out Chromebooks and if a kiddo has a computer issue or something like that, um, how should we go about doing that? Okay, so our we'll we'll attack this from a couple different angles, just in case uh, you are if you're bringing your own device on campus, we won't be able to troubleshoot or provide any tech support for a computer device that is not owned by by our district. However, we will if there is an issue and the student can't resolve it, we will have a device 
available, or at least it's our hope that we will have devices available to loan that student for the day. At this time, we have enough devices to be able to do that. So that is the case. The same thing with a district, if it's a district owned device and there is an issue with it, we will swap those out right then and there and they will have a new device to take home with them and the other device will be repaired and uh, reissued at another time. Awesome. Um, how about switching from hybrid to distance? Um, if, if, a, if family wants to switch from hybrid to distance. Yeah, that is something that when, when you had the opportunity to change or, or select your learning option, uh, it, I think it was in the summertime, the district put out that you will choose, this will be your choice for the year, and if there are going to be changes, they will be made at the trimester. Well, we have moved lots of families back and forth based on their choices up until very recently because we hadn't yet started into our hybrid model. But at this point forward, our classes are balanced. Our A group and our B group within any given classroom, we've taken time to try and balance them out so that one class, one group isn't higher than another in, uh, on any given day. So the movement is a little more difficult now. So we are going to ask that movement be done on a space available basis and we are going to shoot for the trimester to move students. That is generally speaking for students that want to move from distance learning to the hybrid model. That means coming back onto campus. That will be space available and mainly at the trimester. If you are uncomfortable for any reason with being here at Serrano and you want to go to distance learning, that we can accommodate much more easily and we won't ask you to wait for a trimester. But we will want to talk with you over it, make sure that you are making the choice that works best for you and your student. Because once you make that choice, it is difficult to return back to campus for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, okay, so question about kind of in class. Um, this is divider question and the six feet distancing question. So we had a couple of questions about um, dividers, kind of what do they look like, kind of things, why, uh, why the move to not require them and have them optional. And then also to combine with that, working in groups. So that's six feet distance, how will teachers uh, tackle that? All right. Hey, Mr. Rubio, if you have a, a close-up image of a divider and want to share that while I'm talking, I'll give you, you I'll let you share screen. Um, we did show them uh, already in one of the slides, so if you missed it, you can, uh, you know, see that on the recording if you would like. Um, but let me just share with you. Uh, I do believe some other schools have messaged out certain things and uh, about kids and Miss uh, Branley already mentioned kids carrying them around or carrying them home. We won't be doing that uh, at all. They will be a shared device. And what I mean by that is they will be used by another student the next day if they are used in the classroom or be used by another student again after they're sanitized uh, the following period. Um, the desk dividers initially were thought to be a mandatory device. There we go. Well done, Mr. Rubio. So there is a student actually cleaning their desk with a wipe and uh, their divider as well uh, when they're finished with their desk, of course. Um, but the dividers were not seen as necessary when students were socially distanced and wearing a mask. So if a classroom is unable to socially distance, and this does not apply to Serrano because we will have students six feet apart everywhere. If they were not able to adhere to that, the divider would be necessary. Um, students have the option to use one each and every day in every classroom. They will be available. We are not going to make students use them, but if you want your students to use a divider, they will be available and they just have to let their teacher know that that's what they prefer. Some teachers also, I will let you know, some teachers may ask that uh, students 
will use them just as an extra precaution. Um, but right now, we're looking at them school-wide as, as not mandatory, they're optional for student choice. In terms of group work, the group work is possible, but students are still going to remain socially distanced to work with a group, whether it's two students or a group of four, um, they will still have to remain socially distanced. Yeah, and I know that teachers will also be using kind of various instructional strategies, perhaps online and things like that to, to group your students up and keep them socially distanced as well. So in a ver you'll see a variety of instruction in a variety of different classes. So um, another question is, let's see. Um, I uh, think this is a seventh grader. I saw it a couple of times. Seventh grade parents were asking, how will my kid be able to you know, know the campus? Uh, can they get there in advance earlier in the morning to get to know what's going on? Will there be, have, they're going to be lost. And obviously it's not just the parents, but also the students. Yeah, but we will have, I saw a couple questions about will there be staff around campus to help. We're going to have a lot of staff around campus, especially because the one-way hallways are going to be something that's new. So we have additional supervision to remind kids and to make sure that they're flowing in, in the right direction. So um, they, they are, I'm sure they are nervous, but they don't need to be. We will definitely get them where they need to go. Not only that, Ms. Brantley, did they not receive a map this morning or uh, the students? They will receive a map in their planner um, that, you know, comes out through their PE class. So there'll definitely be a campus map in their planner um, as well that they can access this weekend through their PE class. Absolutely. And you may have already received an email from Dr. Turner, our superintendent. If not, you'll receive it later this afternoon. And it will say that some campuses will be open over the weekend for, for students and parents to come visit. Um, I will let you know that Serrano is a closed campus. And what I mean by that is our buildings, our classrooms are 95% of them are interior, meaning they are inside the main building. So if you wanted to come to Serrano to look at the location of your classrooms, you wouldn't be able to access that. You are welcome to come on campus and to kind of look and see where the basketball courts are, where the lineup area might be, where the uh, break area would be. Uh, you can do that, um, but you won't be able to see the interior class locations because the school is, is locked uh, over the weekend. Uh, one question has come up several times is if a student is a hybrid student but does not attend in person because they are sick or um, you know they are you know feeling something um, and they attend online will they be marked absent or if a student is a hybrid should they attend online oh we just had this conversation miss Branley you want to you want to tackle that one? Oh, sure um, yes so um yes absolutely so we would definitely encourage if your student is uh, not able to attend, and in fact, if you're just being cautious, right, and you and they have one of those symptoms checks, right, we want you to, to keep them home during this time. But um, it is great that we have the online learning modality so that students could log in and still get their education. Um, if this happens, I just wanna let you know, the student will be marked absent by their teacher and the reason for this is so that we can make sure you get the information that you need and that your student isn't telling you yeah mom yeah dad i'm going to school and then is just zooming in from the beach so we want to make sure that you know that your student is not learning through the mode that you know you have chosen and you think that they are um, if you have called our attendance clerk and kind of verified that absence, we, that, will also, that will be recoded as a four, which is a present code, right? Meaning that they weren't necessarily there for the live instruction they were scheduled for, but they were present. It is not an absence at all. Or um, if your student participates in that asynchronous or independent learning after the fact, they'll also be coded as a four, meaning it's not absent, it is a present code, your student does not count as, as an absence. So yes, they will be marked absent in that actual class period, but that's only so that we can keep track and make sure that you have the information and you know um, where your student is. 
But if you call into the attendance clerk, like, you know, so many of you do to let us know, hey, my child's sick or let us know about it. Um, after the fact, it will be recoded as a present code, which will be a four, which means, yes, they, they are uh, doing their education and they are present and not absent. Do you think, did that take care of Mr. Young, do you think? That was excellent, yep. Uh, perfect. Um, let's see, how about teachers teaching in person also came up. Will teachers be teaching in person? Will there be a physical person in the classroom? They are real and live and I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing them really live here. So yes, uh, your, your students, uh, when they come on campus, will be in a classroom with their teacher that they have been uh, seeing through the camera for the last uh, five weeks. Um, okay, and then here, here's another biggie. We got some questions about the quarantining of a, of a whole class, of a, what happens if a student tests positive for COVID, right? Will, um, will students who are exposed be quarantined? So a few questions came up about um, that, and can they then learn from home? So if students are quarantined, will they be able to zoom in for that distance portion? I knew when I mentioned that it was going to bring up other questions, but it's good that we talk about this. So absolutely. Uh, yes, like I said, the standard for, uh, for quarantine with regards to our classrooms is such that if a student or a staff member in that same classroom tests positive, there will be a mandatory 14-day quarantine for that classroom. So, and any other classroom that's affected by that student or that teacher. So, when a student is asked to quarantine, we will definitely put them on a distance learning plan for those 14 days. When that 14 day quarantine period is up, then those students will return uh, back to campus. So yes, uh, the learning will continue. It would just be a disruption in terms of where it's at physically, but they will continue on with the same schedule that you saw uh, on slide number four. Perfect. Um, and then Mr. Young, a question about temperatures was way back a zillion years ago when we talked about that. But, um, when are they going to be taken? And um, there were some concerns that rightfully so that maybe PE might cause an elevated temperature because kids are working out and things like that. Yeah, uh, great, great question. So speaking of PE, we do have two zero period PE classes. So students who have a zero period PE class will have their temperature taken there and also in their first hour class. So they each first hour class, four days a week, students will have their temperature taken. Uh, we are aware of the potential fluctuation in temperatures based on activity, whether being somewhere cold or being somewhere hot. So, and specifically being warmer is what's going to trigger a potential alert. So what will happen, let's just say a student is uh, active in PE and they move on to their next class. Um, the only time they will be, their temperature will be checked after PE is if they have zero period PE. So I will use that as the example. So if they come after their zero period PE, get their temperature checked in their first hour class and it's elevated, they will be asked to go to what we call our screening area which is just outside of our health office, near our attendance office windows. They will then have their temperature screened again there with a device that reads more tenths, uh, so we can get a totally accurate uh, reading on their temperature. If they have a higher temperature than 100.4, um, they we will have a little rest period if that's their only symptom. If they have no other symptoms, they'll go through the symptom checklist with our health clerk or with, with our screener, and then they will have their temperature checked again after five minutes. If it's still elevated, they will move to the COVID waiting room. And what that is, it's just a different, it's a, it's a classroom, it's actually our, uh, our theater. Um, it's, a, it's a little mini theater that we've now set up as our waiting room. So they will be sent over to that room. They will have a desk. They will be able to work on their Chromebook and work on their work. 
but we will call home and we will ask that parents come right away to pick that student up. It is really important, parents, that if you have a student who displays any symptoms, whether they actually have the virus or not, if they display any symptoms, we do have to have them picked up as soon as possible. So, you know, get that network of friends, those emergency contacts, everybody who can possibly be on call to help you out there. That's really important. If that's the only symptom they have, let's say their, their temperature, when they the the protocol calls for that student to be sent home and when they are symptom free for 24 hours they can return back to school so symptom free for 24 hours so you when their temperature drops below 100.4 count 24 hours and that's the next time that they can come back on campus okay two questions towards the end here that i'm going to combine right do we test students for covid um, in school, and, and that is a no, students won't be tested here, um, but if we feel like a student meets the requirements for um, us recommending that they are tested, right, then a, then a family would pursue a test outside of school, correct, Mr. Young? That is correct, yeah, we will ask you to see your health care provider. Your health care provider will do one of two things. They will either test you or recommend a test, or they can write you a note saying that you you know, uh, they, they will give you that note saying you, you are well, you are healthy, you are, which will release you to come in. And then um, if, if your child is sick with a fever for just one day, kind of when can they go back? Is it fine that they, that they are allowed back to school or campus? Or do they need a doctor's note before um, stating that their symptoms are not COVID related? Yeah, so no, they, they won't need a doctor's note if it's just the one single symptom. So let's just say at 11 o'clock on Tuesday, your, your student uh, starts getting a fever, starts getting uh, an elevated temperature. That student would have to be symptom-free for 24 hours. So let's just say they became symptom-free at one o'clock that afternoon. 24 hours after, is one o'clock the next day. So they would have to miss the entire next day of school and then they could come back on Thursday. So they would have be, they, they would show the elevated temperature Tuesday midday, take Thursday off, and then they could come, take Wednesday off, I'm sorry, and come back on Thursday. Um, question about instruction in the classroom, to shift gears a little bit. Um, well, will the teachers make a difference? How are they teaching kind of the online students and the hybrid students, the in-seat in kids and the kid, kiddos online? Yeah, that is a, a complicated question. And I will have uh, Ms. Branley kind of share some of her expertise in this area as she has led some of our district level uh, professional development. She has uh, worked with some of our department chairs across our district uh, on this. But uh, there are several different ways. There is no one way to do this. Um, and our teachers have been working on, on doing this uh, and they are learning. So we will be developing this as we go. So we don't expect to have it perfected on Tuesday when, when your students come back. And certainly day by day, we will get better and better at it. Your students will acclimate to it because it's gonna require them to participate and be flexible to go into a breakout room at a certain time or, or meet with a certain group at a different time, receive instruction offline at one time and then live at another time. Ms. Brenly. Yeah, um, I think that the, the mindset, as Mr. Young pointed out, this is a process. Our teachers have never done this and we've never instructed this way. However, it doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of good models for it in education that we've pulled from. So colleges have been doing this for a, a number of years. They call it high flex instruction or concurrent instruction. And so we really looked to major universities for examples, um, reached out to leading educators kind of in the field to give us some training and things. And what we found and what all of our teachers have been trained in and are using our instructional strategies um, like the flipped classrooms. So teachers recording their lessons so that students can um, watch that information independently 
um, and then work with the teacher in small groups to uh, clarify anything they didn't understand uh, or ask questions or kind of make sense of the information. Uh, station rotation. So I think this is going to be one where teachers are really going to use to uh, try to make sure that they are working with or create kind of equitable time, right, that they're working equally with the kids that are sitting in front of them and the kids who are online. And so the station rotation is just creating small groups of, of, kid, of kids in your class, right? These will be kind of virtual groups, not actual groups grouped up. But each of those groups is working on something different. And then that way the teacher can be working with 10 kids, you know, at a time that might all be on a Zoom screen. Some of them are in front of, in the seat there in class and some of them are online. Um, and so that way they can give their time there. And then also the other thing is um, playlists which are kind of kids working through, independently working through in a week, um, the material that, that teachers have pulled together so that the kids move towards mastery of whatever the teacher wanted them to learn, learn from. But I hope what you hear there is that the theme is that teachers are gonna try to build in time to be working with smaller groups of kids. And so they're gonna build pieces of instruction that allow your students to kind of to get the material on their own, right? Whether that's a video of them doing a lecture or a Khan Academy or IXL, which is a new program we have for English and math. Um, get the, the, the information on their own and then come to the teacher either virtually or, or in class, socially distanced, of course, right? And the teacher will then help them make sense of that material and fill in any gaps that the kiddo might have you know, in their knowledge. So that's kind of what we've been working on, but certainly we all share that mindset. Teachers are troubleshooting it. We spent the last few weeks doing massive amounts of training here to give teachers and staffs and have small groups of teachers share information and resources and kind of talk this out to build those 60 minute periods where your kids are going to get some individual attention with your teachers, um, where the out of seat kids, not the kids who aren't in the building are gonna get just as much attention as the kids who are in the building is what we're really pushing towards. And I am very excited about, you know, the, the teachers have really risen to this challenge and they're creating just some awesome, awesome stuff. But of course, we're gonna to continue to learn and we're gonna model that learning for your kiddos when it doesn't go well or when the internet goes down for five minutes. Um, we're gonna model that for your kids that um, we're gonna persevere through it and, and give them really good learning experiences. I wasn't reading any questions while I was doing that though, so I don't have another one. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, do you have any other um, textbooks? I think you kind of answered Mr. Rubio, right? But do kids need to bring textbooks? What do they need to bring with them to school on Tuesday? Uh, just bring your supplies. Double check with your teachers. You know, have your student email the teachers and say, hey, what, what is it that I need? Um, and as uh, we put on the chat several times, many of the textbooks are online already, so they can easily be accessed with their uh, Chromebooks. However, it, it, it's always a good idea just to keep that line of communication open. Hey, Ms. Brantley, what is it that is needed for, you know, your classroom? And, you know, what should I be bringing by? So if the student doesn't need to be carrying a 20 pound textbook, let's not make sure, let's make sure they, they don't carry a 20 pound textbook. So uh, I'm all for that, you know, especially if it's online. I'm definitely an online kind of guy. So I, I want to go ahead and access that. Uh, Mr. Young, uh, there is, there was one question, which, you know, it goes into FERPA and a couple of things like that. Um, do you have any idea how many kids tested positive and any information along those lines here at Serrano? Yeah, well, and, and Mr. Rubio does bring up a, a good point about uh, confidentiality rights. We have a couple of different things that, uh, that ensure confidentiality here and, and the right to privacy. And FERPA is one of those uh, family, family educational rights uh, and protections. Um, and then HIPAA laws, uh, which we're all familiar with uh, through our doctors and such. So if someone should test positive anywhere, their name is not released, whether they're a staff member or a student, their name isn't released. It's not like, hey, we're going on quarantine because so-and-so uh, you know, tested positive. 
that is not notified to anyone outside. There is a certain protocol where if somebody tests positive, obviously the Orange County Healthcare Agency gets involved and they communicate and contact the infected person and they, you know, ask several questions and talk about, you know, where they may have been and uh, if it's been spread or where they got it from, but that's outside of the school. Um, when it's when it's inside of the school, though, there's there's no uh, information given. So and but I but I can tell you right now that uh, especially since we haven't had any students back, we haven't had any students test positive. <laughs> so so I can I can assure you that. Um, and I, I'm actually not aware of really anything that's happened outside of school right now. So we're we're feeling really good about how we're going into this. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question, there's also another question saying, so we're talking about students, we're talking about them coming in and uh, checking their temperatures and whatnot. And somebody asked, well, how do we check teachers? How do we ensure that teachers, you know, are okay to come in and teach? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. It's a good question. And we, we do ask teachers to do the symptom self check each and every day. Um, they are not pre-screened by any formal process on campus. They are required to screen on their own and report their symptoms on their own. Awesome. Um, how about, here's a, we can plug our academic support time, Mr. Young, which I know you love to do, but um, I, know that, uh, I know that our students are doing a great job with, with distance learning, but I also know that it has been challenging. So if a student is kind of struggling, needs a little bit of extra help, needs um, kind of more personal plan made with their teachers where they can talk out kind of the flexibility they need, how can they get that help if they're kind of feeling overwhelmed? Yeah, that's that's excellent. Uh, you know, first and foremost, it starts at the teacher level. So have them communicate and talk to their teacher, so their teacher's aware. Now, it's very likely with the kind of checks and balances system that we are putting in place right now that they may have already been identified by their teacher and somebody may have already reached out to them to encourage them to come to the academic support time. Because what we're trying to do is not only allow students to come to academic support when they feel the need, we are trying to be proactive and try to recruit those students who have demonstrated that there are some gaps or there, there are some things that could be better. So we are asking teachers to recommend them. We have a referral process. We have a group of staff who are responsible for notifying those students and parents, encouraging them, inviting them to come to those academic support hours. Um, just a couple other questions about kind of teacher monitoring um, and the self checks. Are teachers also taking their temperatures um, as well? And what is the monitoring process for them before they get to school? Yeah, I think I, I mentioned that already. There is there is no formal check with uh, the school itself. Teachers are self checking, self monitoring, and self reporting. Okay. A um, couple questions about just kind of why not, or what's the rationale behind that? Yeah, that, that is an, an issue that uh, goes beyond just the principal-staff relationship. That, that is a relationship that, uh, or a mandate that would start from a county office recommendation to a district level recommendation that would transfer down through the union and negotiations. All of that would take place before it would become a site mandate. And none of those things have happened. So it's not a site mandate. Okay. Um, oh, and then how about band class? So are students allowed to use their wind instruments in band class or um, maybe specifics kind of about that or, or even some of our CTE classes, what are they going to be able to use and kind of not use? Yes, our, our PE, our electives and specifically band, uh, you know, we have so many moving parts and pieces there because they are doing so many different things other than a computer keyboard or, you know, a uh, paper and a pencil. So let's talk about band and specifically the question about wind instruments. Uh, you know, first and foremost, band is outside, mandatory outside that is a county requirement. So students will be outside. 
Right now, wind instruments, well, all non-wind instruments are fine. Students will be masked up, will be wearing uh, those masks and they will be, you know, banging on the drums or, or they will be, you know, playing the violin outdoors. The wind instruments right now, uh, we have a temporary hold on them because the county has authorized that they, they have done uh, some research and they have found that the air that exits a wind instrument, whether it's you know from the trombone or through the keys on a saxophone or a flute, that though that air has to be captured or covered, much like wearing a mask. So we have something called bell covers, which have been ordered, which students will place over their wind instrument where the air comes out. They have not arrived yet. So in the meantime, Mr. No, our band teacher, has some alternative exercises and activities for those students. We're hoping those will arrive very soon and students will be able to play their instruments uh, you know, however covered it is, but give them at least the experience of playing and playing with their classmates. There was also a question uh, regarding uh, classroom numbers and schedules and whatnot, and, and we did address it a little bit earlier, but we'll do it again. Uh, there was uh, this morning, actually, students uh, should have viewed uh, through GMS announcements, the Good Morning Serrano announcements, they saw a short video clip on how to check their, their classes, uh, teachers, and classroom numbers. Uh, we suggest that if possible, print it out or take a screenshot or write it down, either way, so that way they have their room numbers. Uh, as Mr. Young stated through the slides for those seventh grade students on the first day uh, for first and fourth period, they're supposed to be meeting in the blacktop area Eighth graders, they meet in the uh, upper field under the solar panels, and uh, there will be teachers there meeting them, bringing them back to the classroom uh, on the first day. So that will ensure that at least students know how to get to their first period and to their fourth period. And then Ms. Branley stated, uh, we will have adults uh, throughout campus uh, during passing period showing students where their next class is. However, we do ask you and the students to please check their uh, schedule, which once again, it was shown to all of them. All of them should have seen it this morning through GMS and a video that Ms. Bean put together for the students exactly where to find that information. So we have, you know, looked at that uh, possibility of students being lost and not knowing what they're going. We truly understand we do ask for that favor on your end. Please make sure that they write down their schedule um, through ARIES, and then uh, we'll be more than happy to help them out here. Do the rest. PE clothes, Mr. Young. Um, <laughs> parents bought PE clothes. A few parents uh, haven't picked them up yet. Will they be able to pick them up eventually? Yes, I want to give a shout out to Adelaide, who is actually wearing a Serrano a PE shirt there. So well done, Adelaide. Look at that. Woohoo! Um, yeah, PE clothes. If you purchase PE clothes and weren't able to pick them up through our Hawk Drive, we did have them uh, on hand there. Uh, we will make them available for you. Um, if you could just be patient and wait at least through the first week of hybrid till we kind of get that settled in and then let your PE teacher know that you purchase clothes, have that receipt and your PE teacher can arrange to get those to you on one of your face-to-face uh, -face class periods. Awesome. Um, speaking of PE, um, personal property, because we're not having lockers. So how will personal property be secured during PE? Ah, very good question. Uh, PE, what will happen is uh, students will take their backpacks out with them to where they begin and where they take, uh, take roll. And their backpacks will be left in that area and they will, no students will be around. They will be left where they are at. Students will come back to them. So in effect, no students will be around them. They will be safe in the sense of they're, they're outdoors. They're not in a locker, 
but they are also not uh, in a traffic area where other students will be able to access them. Our PE, just to let you know, our PE teachers, um, you know, we, we have multiple PE classes going each period, but they have separated far, far, far apart from one another uh, in terms of where their classes are at. So student movement should not be a factor where they place their, uh, their backpacks. And then Ms. Urington, if do you have any questions from anyone that you're translating to, you may have to type it in the chat or in the translation and then go back to it, but any questions from, from your side? And while we're waiting for that, Mr. Young, there, there's been a couple of uh, people and I'm gonna combine two into one. Uh, somebody kept on uh, bringing up the issue of gators and how uh, you know, there's some uh, studies that may or may not show that they're good or not. And I know we've gone back and forth and I know you have an answer for that. The other one is, uh, uh, oh, I lost it. Uh, will the greater Serrano community be advised of any positive case numbers, uh, you know, so that we can quarantine, so on and so forth. So two and one. Yeah, cert certainly. Uh, in terms of mask requirements and basically all of our health requirements, we go off of the county recommendations. Currently, the county list of approved face masks includes gators, so they are currently fine. If the county changes that, changes their recommendation for what constitutes an effective face covering, we will adjust our policy based on the county. And as I think I shared earlier, you know, those goalposts seem to move often. So I appreciate your flexibility in that. Should it change? But we will let you know. So that's how we take our cues from what is acceptable or not uh, regarding that. The second part of that question, uh, Mr. Rubio, can you remind me? I lost myself there. I'll read it. It says, will the greater Serrano community be, community be advised of positive case numbers if their kid isn't in a class that is being quarantined? Okay, so positive case numbers, obviously we all have the same statistics that we can look, look to on a county basis, but in terms of at the school level, right now I'll let you know the county has told us that should we have uh, in what they call an outbreak on our campus that affects more than 5% of our school, that we could be closed down. So it's 5% of our student population or 5% of our staff, we could be shut down. They haven't said exactly how that will work or if it's immediate, instantaneous, how it's monitored, um, but that is what we've been told. And then the district is the same, district statistics, the entire district could be shut down with 5%. And then as you know, and you follow the county statistics, you know, we have the purple, the red level, then we have the amber and gold, I can't remember the, the fourth one, but we also have to fall into the place of where the county is at. I hope that helps. Um, and then masks. So um, are there going to be masks if kids don't have them and things like that? Absolutely. Every classroom has, um, has or is equipped with masks. If kids don't have them, if there's breaks, if they need a new one, um, we certainly have masks in, in every classroom and in the office for, for kiddos and for staff. Yeah. And if, if their mask does break or they do forget it, um, the requirement will be that they have to take the mask that's offered them if they want to remain on campus. They won't have a choice to say, nah, I don't like that kind, or no, it's, it's, not, it's not cool enough or whatever. They, they don't have a choice. Any student must have a mask the entire time they're here. Um, also, I know that probably if you live in this area, you're looking at all the different hybrid models. So why are there so many different hybrid options between school districts, right? Or Irvine has different schedules than us. SVSD chose only two to three hours, hours a day. Yeah, that, that's a, a good question. And obviously <clears throat> district is operated and, uh, and all the decisions are made through a local governing board. We have uh, a board of trustees that oversee our district, five of them and their elected officials, and they have approved the hybrid model that, uh, that we currently have. Obviously other districts have that same option and they approve uh, other models. However, each district 
have to line up with the education code standards. So the California education code has had some drastic uh, measures or drastic uh, changes since we went into the pandemic. And one of those is the instructional minutes. The instructional minutes from before the pandemic have been reduced to now. So it is now 240 minutes per day rather than the 330 prior. So as long as districts are maintaining the, the appropriate uh, amount of instructional minutes, then they are in compliance. How they choose to package that and bundle that, it's, it's open to each individual district. If, if we have a little break here, I do, I do have a, a question for you and feel free to pop it in the chat or, I don't know, we're down to 75 participants. We can take a chance to maybe have a shout out or two here. I, I'm interested to know what concerns you have and maybe even, I, I don't want to necessarily tap into fears that people have, but, but I would like to know what, what concerns you most about having your student come back onto campus and, you know, how can we maybe address that or be, you know, cognizant of that as we watch over our kids and, and make sure they're doing what they need to do. The number one concern you have about coming back? Is it about them wearing a mask? Is it about them, you know, being able to see their friends, interact with their teachers? Um, I think uh, we've got a comment in the chat, higher risk exposure to many people, right? We've all been kind of in a, in a smaller bubble and now this is gonna kind of expand the exposure. Um, limiting socialization, that is certainly a concern for us. Anytime you get middle schoolers together, they are poor social distancers. Yes, and that, that is something that we really want you to partner with us and reinforce those directions because, uh, you know, we will be working with kids. And in fact, we are already kind of instituting this, uh, you know, raise out your arm have your friend raise out their arm. If your fingers touch, you're too close. So whether you are standing outside a break, whether you're you know, in any other situation, you're too close. Now we realize that moving around a campus, there is inevitably going to be multiple opportunities for kids to be closer than that. It's just a byproduct of it, just like us in the supermarket. Um, that we happen to pass by people and be closer than six feet. So we, what we're trying to do is limit those points of contact through no, you know, opposite pathways, um, but also to make those as brief as possible when, uh, when you are close to someone. We have hallways here that are, you know, they're, they're ample sized hallways, but when you have 350 kids, I mean, which is substantially down from 1,100 that we had here last year, 350 kids moving around in a confined space, there will be kids who walk faster than some or slower than others. There will be kids who pass other kids. We just ask that students, as they are moving through the hallway, as they're socializing outside, that they're not as close as they used to be. They are taking a wider path around one another uh, and, and minimizing that time where they're close together. Um, also, just to let you know, you know we, we have so many teachers that are, that are so concerned about you know, that six foot buffer between them and a student, and especially those teachers who are like, I, you know, I'm so used to being at my, my students' desks and conferencing with them and helping them and working with them. And how do I do that? We are not saying that teachers cannot break that six foot bubble. What we're saying, and we're instructing our teachers that limit, uh, you know, keep your proximity to six foot whenever possible. But if you need to step behind a student to look at what's on their Chromebook or to be able to um, give some information to guide a student, 
for a brief moment, yes, you can approach a student to look over their shoulder, to check their work, to provide guidance for them, and then move away. We are just trying to avoid that close contact that, uh, you know, the, the CDC says that uh, for us as adults, the classroom's a, a little bit different than what I mean by the classroom when, when you've got a, a full classroom of students. They say close contact is 15 minutes less than six feet apart. So more than 15 minutes, less than six feet apart. We are really striving to make sure that we are nowhere near 15 minutes, less than six feet anywhere on campus. Um, so we're, we're really working hard to adhere to that. To answer also part of your question, Mr. Young, somebody just wrote nothing. I'm excited that my kids are going back. Someone also posted, they need to change the scenery. I think as parents, we need to change the scenery. But uh, that being said, it's just to answer your question. Some parents are excited and I'm sure their kids are as well. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, we are, we are really looking forward to seeing them. We, we had a handful of students on campus last week uh, who came to help us uh, film some, some uh, videos so that we could kind of demonstrate how students move around campus. And it was just so good to hear them in the hallways and moving around campus. It was so nice. Uh, certain uh, there are other questions which uh, pertains to our uh, support staff, uh, like Ms. Bean, Ms. Blake, uh, and Mr. Wright. Will they still continue to uh, do support only via Zoom, or will they be available in person, like for IEPs and stuff like that as well? Yeah, Ms. Bean, you want to talk about uh, the QR code and how you guys are going to handle uh, students who would like to see you? Yeah, sure. So we are definitely um, open and wanting to see your students. Uh, we do have a lot of restrictions, though, so we're trying to abide by those, but also meet the needs of them and um, let them know that we're still available to them. So a lot of students are used to being able to drop into the guidance office and uh, at least let us know that they want to be seen at some point, and then we call them back in later. So they won't be able to do that anymore. They won't be able to just walk in. Um, sometimes they'll come in with friends and they can't do that, but they can, um, there's a QR code that will be on our guidance door on the outside. And there's also a bit.ly, uh, a website that they can go to and they can write that down. And then, you know, when they get on a device later, they can go and fill out a Google form to let us know that they want to be seen and have an appointment with us. We can have one student in our office as long as it is six feet away. Our offices are a little bit small, but we do have the ability to um, fit a student in our office six feet away from us, and masks will have to be worn, um, but we can do that. And we will be seeing students in person during the day, more on a crisis basis, because we are aware that the school day is short, their time in class is limited, and we really want them to be in class getting their instruction from their teachers and we will see them or call them or Zoom with them as soon as possible to meet their needs. Are there any other questions about that? And I then think, I'll, uh, I'll let you speak to uh, Mr. Uh, Peaks side of things. And I think uh, Adelaide asked a question about uh, what if a student doesn't have a cell phone for the QR code? Okay, so I made the website uh, bit.ly, so I made it really short so they can write it down um, just jot a note and then they can go to that Google form later and fill it out. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, also, there was a question about the schedule in, in this, the hybrid schedule that we adopted in the only two days um, on campus. I believe this was done to keep it as close as possible to the, to the distance schedule that we're currently on. Um, uh, so I think, do you have anything else about that, Mr. Young? You might have more about that. Yeah, it, it was designed to be as close as possible so that there wouldn't be a drastic change in schedule. And also just to let you know, in terms of uh, the A and B groups to try and make sure we kept the same teachers because we moved to this after school started after your students were already in their classes. And you know there, there were a couple of changes, uh, a handful of changes that we needed to make with regards to student schedules to make sure our classes were balanced. But we wanted to avoid 
having to change the entire school. So we, we did a really uh, good job, you know, balancing those out. Um, another question about the, the fewer instructional minutes. So the class time is cut in half of the regular school day. I'm concerned this will affect the students in the long run. What are teachers doing um, differently now to support students? So I think as you mentioned, Mr. Young, right, the ed code did cut our instructional minutes um, down to 240. I also know, I, I mentioned briefly the IXL program, but the district and teachers are using um, some instructional technology to kind of help fill those gaps. And we have IXL for math and English um, as well. So that if they, you know, kind of missed a standard or something last year, that's a, a computer program that it, when they'll use it over time and it'll fill those gaps um, for them. Um, anything else to add? Uh, along with what you're asking, uh, and the uh, reduced minutes, will hybrid, uh, will there be more weeks for this hybrid model added to the school year? No, as, uh, as a matter of fact, just to address that question first and kind of work backwards, uh, the, the school year is remaining the same, 180 days, uh, and the minutes have been adjusted. However, I would guess, and, and this, is, this is me personally talking, uh, I would guess that our state based on where we've been for the last six months, we'll be moving forward with some funding that will allow us to um, hopefully expand our offerings, whether that comes from additional summer school offers or whether that uh, means that we will extend the school day. I don't know, but I, I see something, I, you know, I just have to believe that down the road, our state is going to need to do something across the board to help, uh, you know, mitigate the learning loss that, that potentially has happened, you know, over the last six months. And really that's what our academic support is designed to do, at least in the near term. So that way students who are struggling with a concept or a standard or a skill can work a little bit extra outside of that instructional time that, uh, that has been reduced that we're obligated for, but also be able to provide a little bit of extra time. And uh, you know, we, are, we are looking to do that for lots of our learners. Um, and uh, you know, Ms. Yarrington, you may wanna pass on that we are looking to add um, extra hours of support for our English language learners every day during that academic support time, including Monday, uh, so that they will have an opportunity to have a little bit more support uh, during that time. That is, oh wait, you didn't see. Uh, oh, uh, kids in group A will never go to group B for any reason and vice versa. Yes, they are. They're, they're in it. They're in their group A or their group B, right? Um, there was another question earlier um, that I don't know that we got to, but if, a, if your student misses, is absent on their A day, you know, they're not supposed to come to the B day. That's absolutely correct, right? Everything is balanced, right? Mr. Young did a lot of work balancing classes um, to make sure that the A's and the B's did not mingle, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely wanted to show up on the right day. And uh, we, we know that there will be some mistakes that uh, kids might make in the near term. Oh, I forgot what day it is. Or, oh, I came on the wrong day. We, they won't be allowed to stay. We won't have a place for them. We will have to have them go home. So be, be prepared if they, if they do make that mistake, we may be giving you a call. Um, and certainly we know with our experience with middle school kids, there may be some who are you know left uh, less supervised at home who may want to wander out and see friends. We certainly don't want that to happen either. Yeah. Um, I think, Ms. Rubio, you just answered it about the teachers will be wearing a mask the entire time as well. Of course, this does get in the way of, of lecturing and especially for students that are online. They will have the amplification device, like you said, Mr. Rubio, but it's also one of the other reasons why teachers are working on the instructional um, modes that I talked about with the flipped classroom and recording their lectures beforehand so that students could watch them and then the teacher and the students could work through that material together because we know that that will certainly present a challenge. Just like you said, if a teacher is lecturing, it will be difficult um, for students online or even in the classroom to, to understand everything that they're saying. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, I want to respect all of your time. I know you've given up a substantial part of your afternoon. If there are any last questions in the chat or anything pressing, you know, we want to get to those last questions here before we uh, let you maybe start your weekend. I know we are hours away from starting our weekend here, or at least I know I am. So, uh, <laughs> but we'll let you get yours going. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank right. you. You're so welcome. Good. Okay. You're so excited to see your kiddos on Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> and they're excited to come, and so are we. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good weekend. Yes, thank you, and thank you for all your hard work. I know this hasn't been easy, so I truly do appreciate everything you've done for our kids. So Thanks. thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's so nice to hear. Bye, Adelaide. <laughs>